Hi everyone, it's Calculus by Christy, and in this video I'm going to go through everything you need to know for Unit 8, Applications of Integration. My hope is that this will help you get a 5 on your AP Calculus AB exam, because it does require you to make sure you know your content. And also make sure to check out the description below where I've provided links to all of the other reviews that you can look at, as well as some videos about specific topics that you see over here on the side of the screen. All right, let's get to it. The first thing I want to go over from Unit 8 is the average value of a function. Now, the average value of a continuous function on the interval a to b is 1 divided by b minus a times the integral of a to b of f of x dx. Now, what even is the average value? Well, the average value is the height of a rectangle that would give you the same area as the area under the f of x curve from a to b. And let me write this out for you. So if I found the area of this rectangle, the base would be the difference between b minus a, and the height would be the average value. And it's a rectangle where that area would be the same as the area under the f of x curve from a to b. And I can get to the average value formula if I simply divide over the b minus a, then that gives me this. So that's one thing you're sure to be asked about on the AP exam. Next up is finding position, velocity, and acceleration with integrals. Now we've already talked about position, velocity, and acceleration in a past video by saying if you take the derivative of position, you get velocity, and the derivative of velocity is acceleration. But now what if you wanted to work backwards? So if you are given acceleration and want to find either velocity or position, you need to take the integral. And since the derivative of velocity is acceleration, the integral of acceleration is velocity. So oftentimes you would be given the acceleration equation, and then you would be given velocity at a specific time value so that you can solve for the constant. And likewise, if you needed to find position, you could take the integral of velocity to find position, since the derivative of position is velocity. And again, you may be given a specific position at a specific time value so that you can solve for the constant c. Now another thing that may come in handy is that the integral of a to b of velocity is going to equal the s of b minus s of a, or the change in position from a to b, which is also known as the displacement. Now I can add over the s of a to get what's called the net change theorem. And that tells us then that s of b would be equal to s of a plus the integral from a to b of v of t dt, or this also means that the final position is equal to the initial position plus the change in position, and that may come in handy. Another thing you may ask about is to find the total distance traveled. Now, if you simply take the integral from a to b of velocity, that gives you the net displacement. But if you put an absolute value on velocity inside that integral, that would give you the total distance. That way, you would count both movement this way and movement this way as positive. And that is everything about position, velocity, and acceleration with integrals. Next up is finding the area between curves. So let's say you are, you are asked to find the area of this region R that you see is enclosed between the curves f of x and g of x. To do that, you would want to set up an integral. And this area of region R would be equal to the integral from the intersection point at A to the intersection point at B. And then if your functions are written in terms of x, then you would take the top function minus the bottom function, or in this problem, f of x minus g of x dx. And remember, area is always going to be a positive number. Now what if instead your curves looked like this, for example, and we couldn't do top minus bottom like we did in the last example because you would be subtracting the same exact function. In this case, you would want to actually now only use y variables. 
So your intersection points when you set up your integral is going to be from the intersection point at A, the lowest Y value, to the Y value of the intersection point up at B. And then instead of doing the top function minus the bottom function written in terms of X, you would do then the right function minus the left function written in terms of y. And sometimes this requires you to solve the equation for x so that you can write it in terms of y. And just another reminder that area is always positive. So again, in this example, you would take right minus left and write it in terms of y. And in the last example, you would take the top function minus the bottom function and write it in terms of x. Next up is how to find volumes of solids. So now we're moving into the three-dimensional space after we talked about two-dimensional to find volumes of solids using cross sections. So imagine now you have some two-dimensional region, but now you have cross sections coming out at you that gives the volume of a solid. Now some of those cross sections that could three-dimensionally be coming out of the page at you are squares, where the area is one side squared, a triangle, where the area is one half base times height, an equilateral triangle. This might be a formula you want to review. Root three over four times one of the sides of that triangle squared, a semicircle, which is the area is one half pi r squared, and lastly, you could have a rectangle where the area is base times height. If these cross sections are coming out at you perpendicular to the x-axis, you would then want to write everything in your integral in terms of x. So you would use intersection points of your two-dimensional region as your lowest x value to your highest x value. And then your integrand would be the area of one cross section written in terms of x. So make sure again that you know these formulas and review them. And again, you write everything in terms of x because those cross sections are going to be perpendicular to the x-axis. Now, what if your cross sections are perpendicular to the y-axis? In this case, here's the base of your cross section and then your cross section is coming out towards you. You would want to use y values of intersection, so from A to B, and again, those are going to be y values. And then your integrand would be the area of one cross section, but this time you would write that area of the cross section only in terms of y, and it would be dy. And that's because, again, those cross sections are taken perpendicular this time to the y-axis. Let's talk about another volume of a solid, but this time the solid is created by taking that two-dimensional region and revolving it. So let's say we have this function f of x, and I want to take f of x and I want to revolve it around the x-axis. Well, guess what happens when you take a shape and revolve it and then take a slice or a cross section? That cross section is going to be in the shape of a circle. And you can see here my best rendition of a three-dimensional shape of a circle. And this is going to be something we call a disk. Now this will happen if the axis of revolution is a boundary of the enclosed region. So you can see if I'm rotating this region around the x-axis, it is right along the line or along that boundary of that two-dimensional region. You can see that each cross section will be a disk, simply a circle. And that circle would have a radius of r. And r would be the distance or the difference of your function to your axis of revolution. In this case, it happens to be the x-axis. But you do this with any horizontal axis of revolution. Like I said, that cross section is a circle. So you'd set up your integral to find the volume. And you would do your x values of intersection from a to b. And you'd put the area of one circle pi radius squared. And this would be dx because those cross sections are again perpendicular to the x-axis. Now remember, that radius needs to be written in terms of x. And to find that radius, you can think of some strategies we talked about with the area. You can take the top function minus the bottom function to find that radius. Now you can also take this pi, because it's a constant, and bring it out in front of the integral. 
Now what happens is instead of taking a shape and revolving it around a horizontal axis, what if you took a function or a graph and revolved it around a vertical axis, such as the y-axis or any vertical line? Well, in this case, you can see that your radius runs horizontally. So to find that radius, you would want to take the right function minus the left function, and you would want to use y for this problem. So you'd set up the integral from a to b, where a and b are y values, and pi r squared dy, again, where rate the radius needs to be written in terms of y. And likewise, you can take that pi and bring it out in front of your integral. Now, what if your axis of revolution is not a boundary of the enclosed region, such as this example? Now you have some enclosed region, and let's say I want to revolve this again around the x-axis, and you can see that this region is not touching that axis of revolution. That axis of revolution is not a boundary of that region. Well, this time, if you rotate it, you can see we no longer have a disk. So if there is space between the axis of revolution and the enclosed region, we now have a cross section that is often called a washer. My students like to think about it like a donut. So you can see that one cross section would have this open circle in the middle. Well, we know after the integral, we need to put the area of one of these cross sections. So let's think about how we get the area of one cross section. Well, as you see, we have a larger circle. Let's call that radius a capital R. And then we've got this inside smaller circle. And let's call that a radius of lowercase r. Well, to find the area of this region, this washer region, well, the area would be the, the area of the larger circle, which is pi capital R squared, minus the area of that inner circle, which is pi lowercase r squared. And because both of these areas have a pi, we can simply factor the pi out. And this is what becomes your integrand, or the area of one slice or one cross section. So you'd set up your integral, and I can bring that constant pi in front, and a to b would be your intersection points of your enclosed region, and remember, you'd use x values because those slices are taken perpendicular to the x-axis. Now you can see from the picture that you get your uppercase r, or your radius of your large circle, by taking the upper function minus your lower function, or your axis of revolution. And then likewise, to get your inner radius, or your lowercase r, that'd be the space between your closer function and your axis of revolution. Now sometimes, if your axis of revolution is above your enclosed region, then you may have to do top minus bottom, where top now actually becomes your horizontal line. And everything in this case would be written in terms of x. So these radii, you would need to write in terms of x. Now, I've been using the x-axis as my axis of revolution, but remember, this is the setup for any horizontal axis of revolution. Now, we know that axis of revolution could also be vertical. And you can see here, let's say we have an enclosed region, and now we want to rotate that region around a, a vertical axis of revolution. Well, now you can see your cross section or your slice or your washer is horizontal. So you would only want to use y values in this situation. You would find your uppercase r or your large radius by doing right minus left and same with the lowercase r, right minus left. Now, again, in this case, I'm using a vertical axis of revolution as the y-axis, but it could be any vertical line as your axis of revolution where you would use dy. Now, these values of a and b would now be y values of intersection of that enclosed region, and these radii would only be written in terms of y. So that's it, everybody. That is a review of everything you need to know for Unit 8, Applications of Integration. I hope by watching this video, you get that much closer to getting a 5 on the AP exam. If you find this helpful, make sure to give it a like, and if you haven't subscribed already, make sure to click that subscribe button. Have a great day, everyone, and we'll see you in the next video. Bye.